Think about having your phone fully charged to 100%, that little green battery icon all the way up. Why does that feel so good? Energy in your phone's battery is what allows you to communicate. Powered by energy, your phone can receive and send information anywhere in the world. With a battery full of charge, your phone can run as many apps as you want. You can swipe, type, talk, text, listen, email, even live stream videos. But not with a dead battery though. Without charge, your phone is just a piece of hardware in your hand. But with a battery full of energy, it becomes a powerful communication device. Communication and energy are things I think a lot about. I'm a medical scientist working in an area of research called psychobiology. And what I've come to realize is that the reason we feel so good about having our phones charge is deeply ingrained in our biology. And also that communication and energy are directly linked to our health and well being. You see, energy shaped how humans evolved. One of the keys to Homo sapiens' success was the discovery of fire. Other sources of energy, like electricity, later energized the Industrial Revolution, sparking the modernization of societies. Energy enabled technologies of greater complexity, like the energy that powers our computers, satellites, and the internet that connect us on a global scale. And now, our understanding of energy has the potential to revolutionize medicine because energy is also the most vital element of your body and of your mind. Understanding how energy flows might be the single biggest knowledge gap for medicine, and also the missing link for a transformation in healthcare. As a medical scientist, my team and I work hard to understand the basis of human health. As Peter Sterling says in his book, What is Health? Health is the ability to optimally respond and adapt to challenges. Why do some people remain healthy for decades while others get sick often and die early? For the past two or three decades, scientists have approached this question by focusing on genes. Static stretches of DNA packaged in the cell nucleus. Advances in DNA sequencing technologies show that there are a few important rare diseases that are inherited through DNA caused by mutations in specific genes. So scientists naturally started to wonder, what if the answer to all diseases is in defective genes? What if our genes controlled our health and determined how long we lived? But you see, our genes are like the inert stuff inside our phone. The screen, the computer chip, the charging port, and health is more like the interactive nature of your phone like how it vibrates when you press something, or how the screen turns on when a call or text comes in. Without charge and energy, there's nothing on the screen, blank. The hardware doesn't allow you to experience or to connect with anything unless it's energized, just like your genome. Our inert genes are brought to life by energy. When we look closely into genetic causes of disease, we see that some of the people who have inherited the so-called disease-causing variant or bad gene for a disease never actually develop the illness. And others who don't have the scary risk variant can end up getting sick. Even in diseases historically labeled as genetic, like obesity, individual faulty genes often explain less than 1% of disease risk. And multiple genes combined into what's called polygenic risk scores explain no more than 10 to 15%. So genes play only a minor role in common diseases. And in terms of longevity, the best research from over 50 million people shows that genes predict less than 7% of how long we live. Less than 7%. So when it comes to health and longevity, science shows that genes are mostly not in control. I think medicine has failed to understand health so far because we've essentially focused on the hardware without understanding the role of energy in our health. So how does a human body manage and direct the flow of energy? Well, to understand this, we have to go back to the origin of life itself. 1.5 billion years ago, the only life forms on the planet were single cells of limited complexity. 
At that point, two types of bacterial cells encountered each other. One was a large anaerobic bacterium that couldn't use oxygen to make energy. It was primitive, selfish, primarily focused on growth. And a smaller aerobic bacterium that could make energy from respiration and oxygen. The theory is that either the large one engulfed the small one, or the small one entered and co-opted the large one for shelter and comfort. Either way, the small bacterium inside the larger one developed into a very special cellular structure now called mitochondria. This beneficial evolutionary merger of two bacterial cells is called endosymbiosis, which means working together from the inside. Today, these living mitochondria populate the inside of every cell of your body. They still have their own bacterial genome, a small circular DNA with only 37 critical genes. Cells that need more energy have more mitochondria, up to thousands per cells, and cells with lower energy demand have fewer. In our lab, we can look at mitochondria by making them fluorescent with a special dye so you can see them under the microscope. They're beautiful. They move around the cell cytoplasm, fuse and divide, physically interact with each other, and dynamically respond to energy demand and flow. They even have a life cycle. All the mitochondria die out and are replaced by younger ones. After endosymbiosis, with mitochondria providing energy and information about how to keep energy flowing optimally, cells were then able to evolve greater complexity. Initially worms, fishes, birds, mammals, and eventually humans. So today, our lives are entirely dependent, not just on our phones, but on the ability of our body to provide mitochondria with oxygen to produce energy. That's why the first thing a baby does when it's born is to take a breath, to feed oxygen to their mitochondria. But with increasing complexity, trillions of cells and over a dozen organs that have to work together to make a functional body came the need for tremendous coordination. And to coordinate cellular activities, biology evolved a sophisticated integration center known as the brain. Evidence suggests that the brain did not evolve to think, but to coordinate the sophisticated dialogue between our cells. See, the brain receives, integrates data and input from all senses, and it coordinates every cell and organ. Just like your phone needs energy in its battery to receive, process, and send data, the brain needs energy to do this, a lot of energy. So the cells in your brain are packed with lots of mitochondria. In fact, the brain is only 2% of your body weight, but its mitochondria consume up to 20% of the oxygen and energy of the whole body. It's like a phone with 100 apps running in the background, constantly needing to be charged. Every second, we breathe to bring oxygen into our lungs and blood, and our heart circulates the blood to carry oxygen to every cell and organ including your brain. Just how important feeding oxygen to mitochondria is becomes obvious when things go wrong, like when a stroke or a heart attack cuts off oxygen to the brain. Without the constant delivery of oxygen to mitochondria, everything stops. Your inner screen goes blank and your consciousness ends. Just like a phone running out of battery, spontaneously shutting down on you. Nothing to be done except to charge it up and wait for it to come back to life. Without energy, the body and the mind stop working. Energy doesn't just power all biochemical reactions in the body. It gives us the ability to think, to feel, to worry, and to create. Energy powers our mind. In fact, the human body and mind, or psyche, actually evolved together after endosymbiosis. There are two parts of the same thing powered by the same energy source flowing in your mitochondria. So without understanding how energy flows, we cannot fully understand the forces that link mind and body processes. And because that's so central to life, that means we also cannot understand the basis of health. There are amazing things in medicine that we still don't understand, like why or how people heal. 
Take the placebo effect, for example, which is the effect of a substance that is designed to have no therapeutic value, no active ingredient. Yet, a simple sugar pill given in the right way by the right person can actually cure pain and other severe symptoms. The placebo effect is so powerful that it has to be systematically accounted for in randomized controlled trials of new drugs, where the new drug has to beat the placebo. In most cases, the placebo itself has a significant effect. The mind and the body respond to it, and people do get better. Scientifically, we don't quite understand how a belief in our mind can influence our body's biology so deeply. But it does. And placebos don't work by changing our DNA sequence. How mind and body communicate to shape our long-term health remains one of the biggest mysteries in medicine. And that's not a problem of genes, but one of energy and communication. So what about mitochondria? Do they communicate? Well, if you look at their behavior inside the cell, you see that they function as a dynamic network. They not only move around and fuse to exchange molecules, they can even build tubular cables called nanotunnels to connect to each other, just like bacteria do. And just like your phone connects wirelessly to other mobile phones, mitochondria produce wireless signals that influence each other. So they communicate through multiple mechanisms. Mitochondria can also often migrate around the cell nucleus. And as they surround your 25,000 genes, mitochondria dictate important information to turn on or turn off specific genes. They can even jump between cells to rescue other cells in trouble. Mitochondria have evolved into a social network. They're collaborative and communicative. And we know that this kind of biological communication is vital because losing that alone causes disease. For example, depression is caused by impaired communication between neurons. Alzheimer's disease involves impaired communication between different parts of the brain. And the ultimate loss of communication between cells causes cancer. Cancer cells are cells that have lost touch with their mitochondria and therefore start to rely on other energy sources. They effectively revert back to their ancestral bacterial nature before endosymbiosis, to their selfish unicellular state where growth is all that mattered. Because of that, cancer cells become disconnected from the rest of the network, just like a dead phone unable to connect to anything. Without normal mitochondria and communication, cancer cells end up breaking the social contract with other cells, which threatens the whole organism. But you see, mitochondria not only communicate locally to maintain coherence within and between cells, they also produce hormones that transmit information globally across the whole body. The powerful sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, that cause all of the beautiful changes in a woman's body during pregnancy are made by specialized mitochondria in the ovaries. Testosterone, which determines whether or not you get a penis during development and facial hair in puberty, well, testosterone is also made by mitochondria in the testes. And cortisol, which you might have heard about as the important fight or flight hormone of stress. Well, cortisol is also made by mitochondria in the adrenal glands on top of your kidneys. So all of the key hormones that make new human life possible through pregnancy and allow us to optimally adapt to stress are made by your mitochondria. And an even more amazing thing is that there are other types of mitochondria in the brain, for example, that contain receptors to sense estrogen, testosterone, and cortisol. So you have transmitting mitochondria in parts of the body, sending signals and data to receiver mitochondria in other parts of the body. So mitochondria are like little antennas within your cells, creating an elaborate wireless network of charged devices actively communicating with each other. Recently, our team and others found that during psychological stress, mitochondria can even release pieces of themselves like their circular DNA into the blood. 
We still don't quite know what this means for the organism as a whole, but it just shows yet another way in which mitochondria communicate. And psychological factors not only cause mitochondria to signal, but they can even change their capacity to produce energy, or what we call mitochondrial health. To study mitochondrial health, my team developed a laboratory platform for cells of the immune system in our blood. Using that method, in collaboration with my colleague Elissa Eppel, who studies stress and aging, we found that women who reported feeling more positive emotions, like gratefulness, peacefulness, and love, had mitochondria with 10 to 15% better energy production capacity the next morning. This was an important indication of a direct mind-mitochondria connection, that what we experience in our mind can affect subcellular processes inside our mitochondria. So it's becoming clear that to understand the basis of health, we cannot just study human biology or psychology because the body and the mind are powered by the same thing and communicate via their mitochondria. Naturally, this led to a new interdisciplinary field of research called mitochondrial psychobiology. The goal of mitochondrial psychobiology is to map new pathways of communication between the mind and the body, or the mind-mitochondria connection, to better understand human health. So, as we've seen, energy is the basis of life and evolution, and also the basis of health. What I've come to realize is that the reason we feel so good about having our phones and our bodies fully energized is because it reflects our ability to connect, to communicate, and to be part of the whole. Just like every cell in the body is connected to every other cell and is part of the whole organism. I believe medicine has been over-focused on static genes. As a result, we have a mostly static view of the human body and somewhat of a mental block when it comes to integrating the mind into medicine, wanting to get rid of the placebo effect instead of harnessing its power. What we need to do is to understand how energy flows in the body before you get sick. What if we could map energy flow with enough precision that we could detect disturbances well before they materialize into diseases like cancer? Mapping new energetic pathways linking the mind and the mitochondria may allow us to understand the healing forces behind the placebo effect, for example, and behind our natural resilience that can keep us healthy for decades. An energetic view of health could bring us to a point where we don't have to wait for a disease to show up on a scan or in your blood work before we can do something about your health. And that would be a major step forward to a better life and especially a better life for our children. Thank you.